ambulance service is the patient breathing. My name's Kim, I'm on the ambulance crew, all right? This is the Scottish Ambulance Service. We generally get to make a difference in people's lives. The job literally is life and death. No needles or anything on them, though. There's nothing I would rather do than this. Serving every one of us. It's OK, love. It's all right, don't worry. From Scotland's busiest cities to its wide open countryside. Wherever we have fallen, whatever has happened to us. Need a hug. Just feel she's gonna die. But this is a service under extreme pressure. We're constantly apologizing to people. Yeah, it's very busy down here. Which we rely on like never before. We're two shifts down in the Edinburgh and seeing the borders. Here we go, here we go, here we go. On the front line and at the other end of the line. One, two, three, four. Scotland's paramedics keep Scotland safe. Breathe, breathe the gas. And alive. Help is coming, they're coming as fast as they can. This time, a dog attacks its owner. An ambulance is involved in a road traffic collision. I've never seen that in my life. And Fred is determined not to let his fall get him down. I can go faster. No, no, it's fine. Right. It's fine. Sitting southeast of Edinburgh, Dalkeith has a population of over 14,000 people. It's common for crews stationed here to attend incidents in neighbouring towns. Paramedic Scott and ambulance technician Kim are in the middle of their night shift. Did you notice here fireworks? No, I heard something buying. Oh, that's fire. Yeah. Right. Oh. Amazing. Oh, that's such a fright there. Animal bites. The patient has arm injuries, states down to the bone. The crew are around 10 minutes away from the scene, but the animal, in this case a dog, could be a threat to them as well as the patient so they cannot attend alone. So this is a female. She's been um, attacked by a dog, a staffy dog, in the house. Apparently, they're still attacking her, but they were phoning us to advise. So I'll go on to the police and get them to RVP as well. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. Thank you. Be sweet. Hopefully, it's just not as bad as it sounds. This was quite a worrying job to be attending. We were getting updates from Control, who were telling us that it was still ongoing, so it wasn't like the person had been attacked by a dog and then that had stopped. It was still ongoing, they were still screaming in the background. So we're going to have to wait until police arrive, maybe if the patient come out, because we don't want to go inside, obviously. So it's looking like it's a long, 600 yards on our right. Uh, so just wait here. Scott and Kim are first to arrive on scene, ahead of the police and fire service, who are also en route. I don't know. I think because there's someone hanging at the window. Extreme caution. Cab door open. See yourself. Is the dog secured? Where is it? Right, OK. We basically just wanted to make sure that we're not going to get attacked and be an additional casualty. So if we're not safe to go in, then we don't go in. Are you able to get out of the house? 
try it. No, wait, no, 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 stay no. where you are. You've got to fall. No. Danny, they go anywhere because we don't want the dog out. Can't help. You can't come in and out. We're not coming in. What I'm saying is don't move or you're, you're going to fall. Although the man and his injured partner have managed to separate themselves from the dog, it is still blocking the entrance to the upper floor. The only way in and out of the property is through the window. The gentleman at the window is really distressed. So my concern was that he was going to fall out. There was multiple times where he was kind of sitting half out the window. We did have additional resources come in. We had fire service come in, police, police dogs were coming. There was a lot of sort of resources and it was how we were going to get staff up into that house without any of the dogs potentially going for one of them. With access to the property impossible, the crew are relying on the patient's partner for information. What's your partner's injuries? To me, she's got a big laceration. Is she bleeding heavily? Basically, yeah. Stemming this bleeding is now a priority. So you need to get a bandage, put some pressure over the bleeding. Because the dog will go for me or not. The crew are joined on scene by critical care paramedic Joel. It's OK, mate. Right, listen. I can throw you this. What is it? So listen to me, OK? You're going to break... I it. can't listen when she's screaming. She's in so much pain, mate. OK, so this is a bandage. Yeah. I need you to rip it open and wrap it around anything that's bleeding, OK? Oh, no problem. Right, OK, you get back in the house, get back in the window, I'm going to throw it through the window at you. Oh, I would rather take time to this dog. No, no. Don't go near the dog. Do not go near the dog. It's all right. I'm just coming. Can you make a fire and just to get you? Yeah, yeah, we're yes. going out. They're coming, they're just coming. Get back inside the window, please. Please just go back inside. Ready? Right, put it in the window, mate. Right, okay. go and put a bandage on her. With a dangerous dog blocking access to the patient, the crew can only hope that the patient's partner is able to put a bandage over her wounds. During the month of August, Edinburgh's population swells as performers and tourists from around the world flock to the city for the international and fringe festivals. But with more people in the city, the Scottish Ambulance Service face additional pressures. Accessing patients through the busy crowds can be one of them. Yeah, go ahead. This year, however, paramedic Jack has a secret weapon, an electric bike. Yeah, that's all received. Just confirming that's Rose Street over. It will only take Jack three minutes to get to Rose Street from his current location on the Royal Mile. When the Edinburgh Festival comes to the city in the month of August, it is a complete different challenge to how the ambulance service would normally operate. We've got the pedestrianised zones, we've got down at the Meadows, which is a park, we've got the Princess Street Gardens, all areas where an ambulance cannot really get access. They would have to find a suitable place to park and then go on foot. Whereas for us on the bikes, it just allows us to be able to get through densely compacted areas and be able to provide that emergency care within a much quicker time than, than probably what an ambulance would. Jack is prepared for a throng of international tourists. But today, it's an Edinburgh local who approaches him for help. So I had just finished dealing with uh, an emergency call on Rose Street. And just as I was packing up my equipment, an um, uh, elderly lady approached me. And I would describe her as ap appearing quite pale in colour and initially held on to my arm 
and asked if I could help her because she was feeling unwell, felt like she was going to collapse. Talk me through today. See, I live alone. OK. I've kept going all week, not feeling very well. This is embarrassing. No, you're all right. Listen, we're going to look after you, all right? That's the main thing. So when you've said you've just not been feeling well, what, what sort of description? I have neuropathic pain okay. um, from my base of my spine. At 81, you expect all these things. Nice. I've no feeling in my toes. Um, I've just been feeling very stressed all week okay. and alone, if you know what I mean. Huh? And I miss you. It's not coming back. Is that your husband? He died five years ago, but he was only 60 and I was 56 when he got myeloma. Right. And I thought of not having him when a time like this happens as often. So, how did you get into town today? On the bus. On the bus, OK. But I knew I wasn't well when I left the house, but I thought, get out and give yourself a grip. In my head, I'm thinking, OK, she's, she's, able, she's, she's been able to get out into the centre of Edinburgh, so she must be fit and well to be able to get to the town, but something's obviously changed for her to now feel unwell and have probably just been in the right place at the right time where she's been able to, to come to me and ask for help. But were you feeling dizzy or were you feeling sick? Or... Just feet. Right, well, what to do is let's pop this wee thing in your finger and let's just see what your, what your heart rate's doing. All right. Jack needs to make sure that Wilma doesn't have any serious medical issues that could be causing her to feel unwell. So how, so how is feeling just now, Wilma? Would you say that that's your heart rate going faster than it would normally? Yeah. Do you know what your heart rate would normally sit at? No. I just bit the tip. Really okay. So it's saying that your your heart rate's going about 136 beats a minute. So that's quite fast. Let's do a wee check of your blood pressure then, OK? Do you think you could slip your arm out of this wee jumper? This is embarrassing. It's not embarrassing. You're just lucky we were just here. Oh, it's yeah. See, Joe, I think you look after me up from heaven. That's the truth. Well, that's it. The things that happen. We were meant to be here for up. you. Absolutely. And what about... Have you had your breakfast and things? I wasn't hungry. I've been up since five o'clock. It's okay. not been very good. I've not felt well all morning. Right. So you've not had much food? Hot dog. <laughs> eh? You've had a hot dog? <laughs> not one at the Boston Road. I thought maybe it was my blood sugar level was slow. Was it nice? I'm needing some lunch, so... If you recommend it, I might go there I after. I went to Costa and the agent. Oh, there's... Well, uh, <laughs> a bottle of coffee. <laughs> at the end of the day, the trust is, is probably the biggest part. Your interaction with that patient can go one or two ways very quickly, and that's really how you respond to your patient, how your general attitude is towards your patient that essentially built that trust, where she was then able to tell me a deeply personal and meaningful story for her. So it, it just it's all about that relationship. Now, your blood pressure's good. My blood pressure's, pressure's good. good. All right. While Wilma's blood pressure isn't concerning, Jack discovers she has previously been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is essentially a condition which results in having an, an irregular and can be at times a fast heart rate, which if not treated and not noticed can lead on to blood clots and, and more serious aspects of heart attack and strokes. But one of the key things in my assessment with this lady was that she advised me that she wasn't on any blood thinning medication. Heart rate being a bit high, feeling unwell, looking unwell, gave me cause for concern. Wilma, how would you feel about going up to the hospital today? Hi. Well, your heart rate has gone quite fast. Okay, if, the, if you think I should. Yeah, I think you should. And if, you, if you're feeling generally unwell and I have done I'll for the last couple well. of days, I think I'm just suffering from stress well, and uh, missing you. That? I think I could give myself a shake. But the thing is, if you're not feeling well, your heart rate is going quite fast. Faster than, as you say, it would be normally. 
but everything yeah, is I think th my recommendation would be for you to go up to the Royal to get seen by one of the doctors up there. Let me just speak to my control room and try and see if we can get an ambulance to come and take you up, because I'm just here on my bike, so... One of the challenges of being on the bike in that environment um, is we obviously can't transport people to hospital, so we have to find the most appropriate way of getting our patient to definitive care. Yeah, it was just to give you an update as to where I am just now. I was at that instant on Rose Street, um, which you can clear me from. However, I am now with another elderly lady, which I will require a conveying resource for. Okay, let me take those bags for you. Here you go, Ange. Yep. Yep. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thanks very right. See you later. No problem. The Special Operations Response Team, also known as SORT, respond to some of the most critical 999 calls received by the Scottish Ambulance Service. I know, I know exactly where it is. Just in an ambulance. SORT paramedics Stevie and Pete have just had a call about a road traffic collision involving an ambulance that was travelling to another emergency. Go on, Stevie! The incident happened near Carstairs, a 40-mile journey from the cruise base in Linwood. Driving an ambulance at speed um, is, is very dangerous. You don't know what members of the public are going to do. As a paramedic in the back of an ambulance, you could be dealing with a patient who is seriously ill and you're actually standing up at that time, perhaps try to do a life-saving intervention. So you, you might not have a seatbelt on just due to the fact that you're trying to save that patient's life. And then if you're involved in an RTC by somebody crashing into you, you you're not secured in the vehicle. So yeah, it's still a dangerous job. I was originally contacted to see if we would attend the, the first call but it seemed to be quite minor injuries. But uh, a, local, uh, a local ambulance from, from Bigger attended the, attended the scene. Unfortunately, while they've been attending the scene, uh, a vehicle has been driving around the bend, and the information coming back to us is that it's, uh, it's crashed into the, the back of the ambulance. So uh, hopefully none of our div divisional colleagues have uh, suffered any injury. A local crew are already on scene, but have called for urgent backup. Oh, uh, that's, a... that's not good. The fire service's involvement could mean that a patient is trapped inside their vehicle, and assistance is required to extricate them. When these jobs do come in, thankfully they're few and far between, but when they do come in and I pick up that phone and they tell me that an ambulance is involved, the hairs in the back of my neck really stand up. There's always that wee concern, but as members of the colleagues, you might know the people personally, uh, or you might have met them at, at instance. So there's always that wee bit of anxiety, I think, when you're travelling these jobs. After a 45-minute journey, 
Stevie and Pete are now moments away from the scene. You always know when you're approaching the scene in the RTCs because you'll see a tailback of traffic, first of all. The police had the road cordoned off and the first thing that I could see was, was the ambulance on the correct side of the road. I could see that something had actually hit right down the side of the ambulance, but I just couldn't work out what exactly had happened. Right, I'll go down and see what we can do to assist. Oh. Alright guys, how you doing alright? How you Alright Michael. How you doing? Thanks, How's things alright? Right. So, we've got crew members. Coming this way. I remember the toilets provides a year from It's actually been airborne. And she was she actually hit in the top of that. So the face is getting executed in the fire service house in the back of the salons. Right. The two staff members have got how are they? One's got more back pain and yeah. another one's got an injury to the top of the head. That's right. this is I've, I've, I've never seen that. I've never seen that ever in my life. Point. I, I know, wonder she ducked. You seen this? Unbelievable, mate. Really, really lucky. Really lucky. Crew's been uh, taken to hospital just to get checked up, but they've been very, very lucky, as you can see. The driver of another vehicle had left the road, went eight, nine feet into there, and then lands where she is. They've been extremely lucky uh, for all concerned. It appears the car hit an embankment, causing it to clip the roof of the ambulance. If that car had dropped down about a metre, it went through the windscreen of the ambulance. My colleagues were extremely lucky, uh, really, to survive this. Yeah, they were, they were very fortunate that day, very lucky. Satisfied that the three casualties are safely en route to hospital, Pete and Stevie can make their way back to base. Near Dalkeith, Kim and Scott are still unable to reach a woman who has been bitten by her dog. They're waiting for the fire service to gain access through the first floor window. At the moment, the only person able to attend to the patient is her partner, who has stood at the window. We're not going in. Have you done that bandage? Mate, 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 mate. Oh, stay in there. Stay. Get back inside. No. Officer, can I speak to you? Can you get the fire crew here? Get the mud, get the permit in the fire, fire please! Are we getting the fire crew? If she's got any bleeding, can you put some pressure on it? I'm trying to, but I can't deal with the situation. Come on, I guess I can't deal with it. Yeah, I know you can't Listen, I know you can't, all right? We had given him some first aid advice, so we'd, we'd given some bandages up to put pressure on the wounds, because he had stated that she was the patient was bleeding. Um, but he just he couldn't do it, he kept retching. He just couldn't seem to calm himself down enough to, to do any of that. Could you take a picture, maybe? Yeah. Are you good at catching? I'm very good at catching, mate. If I take a photo, I'll catch your phone. Do you want a blanket, just in case? <laughs> yeah. Yeah? If the man can get a photo of the injuries for the crew, they can be better prepared for when they do get access. Just throw the phone down, mate. I've got that on the phone, right? Throw it down and let's have a look at the pals. The paramedics can assess you. Thank you for that. Fine. So that's. Is that an arm? Yeah. Hopefully so. 
done for me, Randy. This picture, is that the only bleeding? Or is she yeah, hurt anywhere else? Yes, go and have a look. You take your time. Go and have a look, you're doing great. Go and have a time. You're doing great, mate. I was expecting a whole arm, yeah. like, but it's still bad. The photograph that we did see did have multiple puncture wounds. There is potential for open wounds to sort of get infection, sort of lead to sepsis. Oh, here's the fire service coming now. The fire service start taking the patient's partner out of the house. But Scott is keen to get to the patient. I think I want to go in first. Aye. Put him in, I'll go in first and see the patient. Turn in, medic. You get a hard eye, please. We will, pal. We will look. They're coming up in the new, all right? I'll hold your ladder. It's OK, thanks, pal. Listen, I've got paramedics here. Let me see the leg. Which leg? No, no. This, one. this one here. Ow! Give me your arm, sweetheart. Ow! Going in, just initially find a female um, who was lying on the floor, screaming in pain. So there was at, at least two wounds that were quite significant, um, which were full thickness, down to the bone. You can see all the, the fat, the tissue, the muscle. The other ones were just kind of puncture wounds. Listen, I'm going to try and put this cannula in your arm. It's a really small one, but try and please stay still. I'm going to give you painkillers. <laughs> Jihad's had some bleeding, and that was reflected in our heart rate and our blood pressure as well. So our blood pressure was a bit lower, heart rate was elevated, so, you know, and there was obvious signs of blood loss within the house. Although the dog that bit the patient is outside the room, Scott wants to remove the patient as quickly as possible. It was a glass door, so I could see the dogs. I knew that they were secure, they wouldn't be able to get through, so I was quite happy to stay there. Chris, if you can elevate slightly. We'll get you into the ambulance, all right? The patient will be taken to Edinburgh Royal Infirmary for treatment. Yeah, 3716, just to pass this trauma. Stand by, please, for a female who has been attacked by a dog and has multiple wounds. Is 10 minutes over. Royal Annie standing by. At one of the ambulance control centres in South Queensbury. Call handler Amy is taking 999 calls from across Scotland. Ambulance service, is the patient breathing? And is the patient awake? Amy establishes that the patient is breathing, but not conscious. Tell me exactly what's happened. The caller tells Amy that their child has had a seizure and is still twitching. The things that we need to know when someone's having a seizure are the length of time that they've been seizing for already, what kind of seizure they're having, if they've had more than one in a row, if they're epileptic, is this normal for them, is this a different kind of seizure? And um, so every, every seizure call is different because seizures are so different. And are you with him just now? OK. And I just need to confirm, is he still unconscious? OK, so we're going to check his breathing together to make sure it's all right. So when I say go, watch him closely and tell me each time his chest rises, OK? So are you ready? OK, go. The 
patient is breathing regularly. But as the caller answers Amy's questions, the computerized dispatch system decides that an ambulance response is needed. All right, I'm organizing help for you now. Stay on the line and I'll tell you exactly what to do next. It's pretty much a 50-50 with parents calling for their children. Some people are very, very calm. I think it just depends on your fight or flight mode. Some parents see their child hurt or having a seizure and they panic and then that comes through on the call and it's quite hard to, to give instructions to someone who's panicking because they tend to not take in the information. So you have to either repeat yourself a few times or stop and, and try and reassure them and calm them down a little bit to then get the information across that you need to. Okay, so listen carefully, lay him flat on his back and remove anything under his head. And let me know when you've done that. Okay, so stay right with him and make sure his head is tilted back and check his breathing often. If he vomits, turn him on his side and clean out his mouth and nose. Now I'm going to stay on the line with you until help arrives, so tell me when the ambulance crew is right with him or if anything changes. Having a patient on their back, if they're unconscious, with their head tilted back protects their airways, so it ensures that their breathing is, is as effective as it can be. Any information Amy can get before the ambulance arrives will be passed on to the crew. I'm just going to ask you a few more questions, OK? So has he had more than one fit in a row? All right, so if he's still fitting, don't do resuscitation, don't hold him down or put anything into his mouth and move dangerous objects away from him and tell me immediately when he stops, OK? All right, I'm still going to stay on the line with you. The crew are now only minutes from the scene, but Amy stays on the line in case the situation worsens. I don't find it stressful staying on the phone with people. I think sometimes it's, it's beneficial for callers who are upset or stressed because they feel a little bit more reassured that somebody's on the phone with them and it's somebody who's linked to help. All right, OK, perfect. If the crew are there, then I'll leave you with the crew, OK? All right, take care. Bye-bye. The borders stretch from the Pentland Hills, south of Edinburgh, to the Cheviot Hills on the English border. The region is home to 116,000 people, and ambulance crews often have to travel long distances to reach those needing care. Fortunately, for Kelso paramedics Keith and Ruth, their next job is local. Oh, dear. Oh, bless. Can't get up. Has somebody been out, does it say? I take care. It could be carers just phoning NHS 24 or anything that yeah. comes up at the same time. Oh, NHS 24. Or they've the help, phoned the health centre or something. Reese's gone. So we're going to an 82 year old male that's calling. We'll just check that it is definitely a fall and not a collapse. Yeah. That's always a concern. A collapse is generally something that will come that a patient has kind of either lost consciousness and caused them to fall or uh, had a kind of fainting episode causing them to fall. If we're going to a patient that's slip tripped out of bed or while walking, we're looking to see if they've had an injury because of that fall or if it's a medical issue that's caused them to collapse. Keith and Ruth are met on scene by two nurses who were contacted by the patient after he fell. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? So, Hi there, ladies. Hello. Who's this young man? Hello. Great. Hello, sir. Third Hello. fall in the oh, last 24 no. hours. I had the ambulance go out to him yesterday. Right. Well, it's two him times up. yesterday. Yes. And when did he fall? Half an hour ago, maybe, Fred? Yeah. Right, OK. Hard. Because I knew I wasn't going to make it somehow. To the chair. Yeah. 
there because I was too sure. trained up full again. <laughs> I, I thought, you know, and you didn't Warden. behave. Typical man, doesn't do what he's told. Fred has fallen multiple times in the last 24 hours. Keith and Ruth must make sure that he has not injured himself on this occasion. Fred, yes, so my name's Ruth. Ruth. This is Keith. Ruth is so OK. I'm trying to remember that, you know. Now, first, are you hurt? Have you hurt yourself? No, not, not really. Um, I'm a wee bit sore. Because you're lying at a funny angle. I, and my yeah. arm's sore here. Yeah. On the, here, you see. We're you getting up from the chair. From my chair there. Right. I was looking for my glasses, that's right. All. Oh, right. I never got a chance to pick them up. I just <laughs> right. flying. Right, so you don't know what caused the fall? I think it was more like slipping. Right. Now, the, these were, shoes were altered in the hospital. OK. Mm. Uh, but I'm finding now mm. I'm slipping here. Right, on the line. Right. And I was t that's only a month old. Right. Right. And I was told that that would stop me slipping in. Right, okay. Is it supposed to be non slip stuff? Aye, is it hell? <laughs> <laughs> One of our main concerns is that the patient might have sustained a head injury. So we need to make sure that they are alert and orientated. He was able to tell us exactly how he had landed on the floor, as opposed to, I don't know, I've just, I'm just on the floor, which might suggest that he'd had a faint or a, a collapse. Oh, yeah. I just want you to see if you're sore at all when I'm yeah. feeling down your neck, OK? No pain there? No. No. No pain in your shoulders? No. Just going to have a wee feel of your legs. There's no pain in your legs no. there at all. OK. Even if Fred hasn't injured himself in the fall, safely moving an elderly man in such a frail condition will not be easy. In Dalkeith, Kim and Scott are at the beginning of another shift and have just received their first job of the day. So, 81-year-old male, breathing problems and COVID positive. It's the summer of 2022. One in 20 people in Scotland are testing positive for COVID-19. But despite the high rate of infection, the number of people going to hospital is significantly lower than at the height of the pandemic. So it's, it's becoming quite rare now that we're getting called for positive cases, but yeah, it's still around. And for some people with underlying health conditions, the virus is still a real concern. Look and see if there's any history, any sort yeah. of breathing problems. We're 650 yards away. We're just in here. Thank God for sat now, because I've got my direction completely off. No <laughs> chance. I'll be able to find it anywhere. Edward. Hi. Hi, Edward. <coughs> What's been happening with you sure. today? I've got COVID. You've got COVID. Do you have any breathing problems normally? Yes. Hi. What do you I've have? Got, I've got heart failure. Okay. So I've got heart failure and I've got it. It's COPD. It's COPD, is COPD, it? COPD, right. Okay. COPD is a chronic obstructive respiratory condition which causes shortness of breath and sort of episodes of exacerbation, so extreme sort of shortness of breath. Um, we see it quite a lot, especially on elderly patients. Edward's COPD puts him at a higher risk of developing complications from COVID-19. <coughs> it's okay. I'll have a wee listen to your chest, okay? 
Do you mind if I lift your top up? Perfect. So just some nice deep breaths in and out. Nice deep breaths in and out. Okay. Yeah, we just have a wee wheeze. You want to do a rest count, come when you get a chance? Yeah, of course. Do that now. He certainly did have some respiratory signs, so he had some difficulty in breathing and he could hear a, a wheeze. I think there was a level of anxiety there as well. It's been a difficult time for Edward's family, as his wife has also been unwell and is currently in the Western General Hospital in Edinburgh. Is it dog in, is it? I've not seen a dog. On the fence there. Oh, right. Just the door was open. Oh, he's on the couch. He's missing his mm -hmm. arm. When did she go into hospital? Yesterday. And was that, was that with COVID as well? Well, it started with COVID, but... She took out, she's got a bit of a chest infection and it's affecting her dementia. Right, okay. I was spoken to her this morning, so she, she's in the ward and the... She on the mend? No, oh, well, we're waiting on doctors coming round, isn't uh -huh. it? That's coming off her. Oh, it's okay. I'll sort that. Yeah, I've got an estimate of 32 over. just now, but that's while he's talking as well, so it's quite difficult. <laughs> No, you're OK to talk. <laughs> We're just counting your respirate, that's OK. Kim counts Edward's respiratory rate as 32 breaths per minute, double the rate of an average adult. We'll just give you a nebulizer as well, because you sound a wee bit wheezy. <coughs> <coughs> uh, aye, that'd be perfect, <coughs> thank you. A uh, salbutamol nebulizer basically opens up all their airways and they're able to get some relief from the. It's the same sort of drug as people have got their wee blue inhalers. Um, that's a salbutamol inhaler, so it's, a, it's the exact same as that, just driven through oxygen. Does that feel any better with the nebulizer there? <coughs> it's so freezing Yeah. I think you probably gathered already the plan's going to be we'll pop you up to the hospital and get you checked out. Yeah? Is that okay with you? What one? It'll be the Royal Infirmary. A, diff a different one for your wife. <laughs> that's she know in the Royal, That's she typical, not? Eh? She's in the Western. She's in the Western, yeah. OK. OK, well, I could just sniff out and get a chair. Perfect, yeah, yeah. Um, get the bed and that's it. Edward's, um... He really is making quite a, an extensive effort. With his breathing at the moment, you can sort of see his respirate's high. So he's got a bit of breathing history already. He's got COPD, so having COVID will not obviously help. So we're going to take him up to a &E at the Royal. He was saying that his wife's in the Western just now. Unfortunately, we can't take patients to the Western unless it's been authorised by GPs previously. So. I think he's a bit upset. Although Scott and Kim no longer attend as many patients with COVID-19, the height of the pandemic is still a recent memory. I've got to go home to my husband and my child at that time. And I was trying to think, well, do I move somewhere else um, and live somewhere else while I'm working through COVID? But thankfully, they were really supportive at home. And I'll tip you back again. You've got a job to do, but at the same time, you know that you're going back to your family and stuff, so um, young children, taking it home to them. We'll get you hooked up back to our machines, OK? And then we'll get you in. How are you feeling? Get a little isolation You'll probably have a, a bay to yourself, which is good. OK, grand at that, Kim. Yeah, no worries. The journey to the hospital will take 20 minutes. You don't even look 81 years old. No. No? I'm still feeling it. Feeling it today. We are literally two minutes and we'll be at the hospital. The last bumpy bit on the way down the road. 
Kim must alert the hospital that Edward is COVID positive so they can separate him from other patients. Sorry about the delay there, and they were trying to find a cubicle. Right, we'll get you taken in. Nearly three years after the pandemic began, patients and staff are still dealing with COVID in Scotland. At the ambulance control centre in South Queensbury, callers are often highly agitated when they phone in. Tell me exactly what's happened. The caller tells Amy that she's out of breath and her heart is racing so fast that it's beginning to hurt. OK, are you by yourself just now? And how old are you? The caller confirms that they are in their 20s and currently on their own. People phoning in that young with cardiac symptoms isn't all that uncommon, but for people who are older, it's more common for it to be something a little bit more serious with like elevated heart rates and cardiac symptoms. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have a history of heart problems? And are you clammy or having cold sweats? Okay. And I just need to confirm, do you have chest pain or chest discomfort? Amy needs to find out exactly how fast the caller's heart is beating so the automated system can decide on an appropriate response. OK, I'm going to tell you how to take your own pulse, OK? So find the Adam's apple on your neck, use two fingers to feel either side of it for a pulse and tell me when you've found it. OK, so count each beat out loud so I can time you starting now. Just count the beat out loud, so just one, two, three, four, and just until I tell you to stop, OK? All right, so starting now. When they start counting, we start a timer that's for a set amount of seconds, and then depending on what number they get to, when our timer is up, we then put that into the system. The system tells us what their heart rate is, and then we go from there. All right, so it is, it is beating a little bit faster, but it is still within the normal limit. It's OK. Although the symptoms sound serious, not every call results in an ambulance call out. So from the information provided, an emergency ambulance response would not be best for you at the moment, OK? And we would advise that you seek advice from NHS Inform Online to phone your GP or call NHS 24 on 111 for the symptoms you describe. Do you understand this advice? So based on the answers that the caller had given, it's not that she necessarily doesn't need to go to hospital, just it doesn't need to be an ambulance that takes her in. But please call us back immediately if your condition worsens in any way, OK? All right, take care. Bye-bye. In Kelso, Paramedics Keith and Ruth are satisfied that Fred hasn't injured himself falling over and are preparing to lift him up off the floor. Are you able to bend this knee at all? And all we're going to do is we're going to stand up together, Fred, OK? Right, so me and Ruth are either side of oh, you. Can you You're right. in there, yeah. All right, and we're just going to stand up on three. One, two, three. Up we come, Fred. Well done. I tell you I had muscles, didn't I? <sighs> Okay. Are you now, OK? Take a second, take a second. Lean went... forward onto that table for me. That's it. There's the specs. You just bend in the middle and sit yourself down. I've got you. We're not going to let you fall, OK? Yeah. How does that feel? That's fine, eh? Is that much better? Much better. With Fred sitting down, Keith wants to check that he doesn't have any medical issues that could have caused the fall. All right, my man. How about we do a couple of checks, eh? Yeah? Sure. Here we are. OK. I've never sworn so much in my life. What's that? Right, yeah. I've never sworn so much All right. <laughs> Was it just like a simple trip, yes, the one you had yesterday? Similar. They're all similar. similar. And I'm so lucky so far mm -hmm. that I've never broken anything. Yeah. You yeah. Know, 
get out of the train the next day. Right. For I've never broken right. in. And the tablets I were on, the doctor stopped them from yeah. this morning. The girls were saying that. Uh, and he said that, look, Fred, if you carry on, it's all going to change and you will break various parts uh, of your bones. He says, we don't want that to happen. No. So I think what they're doing is they're taking the fill away. Fred had had several falls in the last couple of days, um, which would normally worry us. But in this case, Fred had he'd spoken to his GP and the GP had stopped one of his medications. And the GP was hoping that when it completely left his system, then the fall should stop. So do you stay here yourself or? I'm on my own. You're on your own. I had two dogs, but I couldn't do it. Oh, that's a shame. They're up there. A bulldog. A bulldog? Aye, it was a cracker. Where are they now, then? Well, my son, one of my sons took him over to Fife. Uh-huh. And he's been nearly three years there. Right. And he brings him over the case. Uh-huh. And that wee man comes up, licks my face, he still knows you. Still knows you. But I'm lonely without them. I'm nothing. Of course you will. You know. Despite his fall, Fred's observations show he's in remarkably good health. You've got the heart rate of an athlete. Is it bad? No, it's good. It's well, good. That's fine, I wonder. Yeah. Your blood pressure's amazing as well. It is. Perfect. See, every time that you guys have come, they said the same sort of thing. Right. All the statistics are pretty good. Are good. Fabulous. And that's the reason I never go to hospital. And would you want to go to hospital no, or would you want to? No, no. 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 I mean, I'd, I'm not seeing a reason to take you in or anything. No, no, no. But we would like to see you on your feet before we make that decision. Oh, yeah, it's we right. need to make sure that you're safe to be left. That's right, I understand that. But yeah. your observations are great. They're, perfect. They're better than mine. Much better than mine. When someone's had a fall uh, and they're uninjured, we do a kind of what's called a get up and go test to see if they can mobilise themselves and therefore look after themselves once we've left. Fred, You're yeah. going to go eat. no, we want to see you up on your feet. So what, wait a wee minute, right. you did a run. <laughs> what I want you to do is, I want you to get up as you would normally, right. and I want you to walk just past your walker there, right. and then turn round and then you can have a seat on that chair. Is that where you would rather be? I would rather your big, be. Your big right. chair. Yeah. And, right, now hang on. <laughs> oh, hold on, you're straight up, eh? So this is normal posture. This is normal, right. Right. I can go faster if No, no, it's fine. Right. Take your time. <laughs> right. This is where I do a waltz. Right. I'm happy to dance ah. if you want. Keep it nice and steady, OK? <laughs> Yes, I've got all fields are on the floor. The quicker you go, I find that that's when the accidents can happen. Exactly, you need to go nice and slow. You want to go in this chair? You yeah, go and have a sit down. You go that, just straight down. Sorted. Good man. With Fred back in his chair, Ruth decides to do one final check before leaving him at home. Listen, my love, can I have a little listen to your chest? Of course. Is that OK? Then you have to ask me. Well, I have to. I do have to ask. No, no. Can I just lift your top up a wee bit? Thank you. Thank you. Right, just nice deep breaths for me. Good, lad. Perfect. This is better than going to the hospital. Of course it is. Of course it is. Of course it is. And we're more glamorous as well. As well as that, too. Well, Keith is. Right there. <laughs> I noticed that right away when you came in. Fred. I thought, my God, I wish I was 40 years younger. <laughs> Fred was a cracker, wasn't he? He was, he was very cheery. He was, he was very happy. Yeah, yeah. He was lovely. He was very happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> we had such a good blather. I think we're quite happy that we don't need to take you into the hospital today, OK? Obviously, if you have another fall, then press your button and get somebody, do you know, to get you up. Or get us, do you know, whatever, whatever you need. Well, I wouldn't want to press the button for you. It's not fair on you because... We do get paid for this. 
I know, but you we didn't do it for fun. More important patients. <laughs> Not at all. We've got plenty Not of ambulances. Yeah, okay. we've got loads. Yeah. Absolutely. We often find that, especially with elderly patients, um, they don't want to be a bother. Well, they will lie all night with broken hips because they don't want to bother anybody, even though the crews are, uh, we work 24 hours. It's far easier if we can be involved early, because the quicker we can get you up, the less chance there is of developing further injuries through lying on the floor. Whereas if we can attend quickly and help them up, especially if they're uninjured, and leave them at home, then they will be well for longer. Keith and Ruth feel comfortable that Fred will be safe in his own home and have managed to avoid taking him to hospital on this occasion. Take care, Fred. Right, All the best, my lord. See you later. Thank you. He was a character, wasn't he? He was. He was a nice brilliant. Role. He was. He's clearly got a really good relationship with Kara and the nurses. Aye, yeah. Which is good. He's clearly well looked after. But like that's a lot of our jobs, isn't it? Eh? Just that's oh, a lot aye. of our jobs. Just a lot social, isn't it? Yeah, just... picking people up, checking them, leaving them, hopefully. Because they didn't need to go to hospital. Oh, no, no. We didn't want to take any, but if they didn't need to go. That's too right. We can check him and make sure he's okay and he's going to be safe at home. They're the jobs that you come away for like the smiling. They're the nice jobs that are just he's happy. He's at home. There's no heart, which is what we want. Oh, I know. The crew make their way back to base, where Ruth hopes her voice will recover after a busy day. My voice is getting worse. I'll get you a hot chocolate or a hot bovril when we get him. A bovril? A bovril. He's, he's a hot chocolate. Bovril's just like gravy. Exactly. Yeah. It's perfect, that's what you need. Oh. A big cup of gravy. No, you can pour me a gin. A gin? Oh, yeah. I suppose I'm driving, so... Exactly, it'll be fine. I've not had one this shift yet. <laughs> <laughs>